Well, I guess I'll introduce myself to, <laughs> I've met most of you, but for those of you that I haven't met, I'm Steph Pulley. I'm the state coordinator for the University of Maryland Extension Master Gardener Program. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. Very happy to have everyone with us. And I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Marsha so she can make a comment about our group of Master Gardeners in Baltimore County. And she can also introduce our speaker for the evening. So welcome, Marsha. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I did want to, say, and thank you, especially Stephanie, for setting this up. Um, we, I, um, I am Marsha Howes. I'm a Baltimore County Master Gardener volunteer educator, and um, we had um, been talking in our group about all the comments that uh, people were asking about cicadas, and it seemed uh, pretty, pretty appropriate to um, try to convene this webinar this evening. So on behalf of the Baltimore County Master Gardeners, I am pleased to welcome you to this evening's webinar and give a shout out to our organization. We are off the gardening session and invite you to visit the Baltimore County Master Gardener Demonstration Garden. It is located at 1114 Schwann Road in Cockeysville, Maryland. 21030. So if you are in the vicinity, please drop in. Um, I'm excited to introduce this evening's presentation of the return of the cicadas in 2021, fun, fear, and fascination. For many of you, Dr. Michael Raup is no stranger. He is a professor emeritus of entomology and extension specialist uh, at the University of Maryland. He has written Bug of the Week for over 15 years and is a frequent Bug of the Week expert for Good Morning America, NPR, and other news outlets. He has appeared on BBC, CNN, National Geographic, Ultimate Explorer, among others. He recently contributed to the March 9th Washington Post article on Rood 10 Cicadas. He takes amazing photo photos and his sense of humor and keen observation mean that his presentations are never boring. With no further, with no further ado, I welcome Dr. Michael Raup and thank you so much. Well, thank you, Marcia. And thanks a lot, Stephanie, for putting this together. And to those of you who are joining tonight, well, thank you very much for allowing me and some of the big boys to come and join you in your home this evening or wherever that might be. So without further ado, let's go ahead. We'll do a share screen and uh, maybe somebody can give me a thumbs up. Yep, I'll let you know. If we really do have this correct. <laughs> what do you think, Steph? Are we yep, good? That looks perfect. Okay, great. You know, a lot of people will be coming to, uh, you know, the DMV this year, and uh, they're not really going to be so interested in the Washington Monument itself, but they might be more interested in all the cicadas, including some very large ones that we may actually see. We're going to take a little bit of a Oh, a trip back in history and talk a little bit about cicadas here in North America. Um, William Bradford, who you may know, was the second governor of the Massachusetts colony in 1633, had a chance to share some of his thoughts about periodical cicadas. This is what William had to say. All the month of May, there was such a quantity of a great sort of flies, like for bigness to wasp or bumblebees, which came out of holes in the ground and ate green things and made such a constant yelling noise as made all the woods ring of them and ready to death the hearers. Well, I think that's a little over the top. The first published account of cicadas I could find in the New World came from a uh, monograph by Henry Oldenburg, which was in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London. And this is what Henry had to say. A great observer who hath lived long in New England did upon occasion relate to a friend of his in London where he lately was. 
that some few years since there was such a swarm of a certain kind of flies in that English colony that for the space of 200 miles, they poisoned and destroyed all the trees in the country. They're being found in innumerable little holes in the ground out of which those insects broke forth in the form of maggots which turned into flies that had a tail or sting, which they struck into the tree and thereby envenomized it and killed it. Mm, I think there's a little hyperbole involved in this one as well. A little closer to home here in Maryland in the Annapolis Gazette in April 3rd, 1751, an anonymous contributor wrote the following. We are informed in some places the locusts have been found in great plenty just under the surface of the earth, almost at their full growth. May God avert our impending calamities. This was serious business. Now understand that many of our original forefathers colonized North America, escaping religious persecution. So here they arrived in a new world. They looked under the ground where they found up in the treetops hordes and hordes of insects. Hey, they might have thought they were back in Egypt and this was the eighth biblical plague. So I think that's probably how the name locust became attached to periodical cicadas. Now locusts, as you know, are grasshoppers that sometimes swarm and cause devastation of crops. Whereas our friend, the periodical cicada is a sucking insect much more closely related to something like an aphid. And I'm sure all my master gardener friends will remember that those periodical cicadas belong to that big group, which we call the hemiptera, right gang? Little pop quiz there. So people will say, what's the big deal? Don't we see cicadas every year? And sure we do. Every year we see the annual or dog day cicadas. These guys take anywhere from about two to eight years to develop underground. Some adults emerge every year, hence the name annual cicada. They appear during the dog days, usually in late June, July through mid August. Sometimes this will trail off into September as well. They're greenish in color and their survival strategy involves both what we call crypsis. They're colored like the plants they feed on up in the treetops. They're very, very hard to spot. And if you approach these cicadas, they can fly like F-14s. So their strategy for survival is what we call stealth and speed. The periodical cicada, on the other hand, takes anywhere from 13 to 17 years to develop they're going to emerge synchronously, three different species in mass, and the densities can be astounding. They can be as many as 1.5 million per acre. They're going to appear eh, maybe in early May, but certainly by mid-May and June, we'll talk more about this in a few minutes. They have red eyes and orange wings, and their survival strategy is one of the strangest in all the world of creatures on this planet. It's called predator satiation. What this means, they're going to emerge in such vast numbers simultaneously that they're gonna fill all the bellies of every predator that wants to eat them. And there are still gonna be enough cicadas left perpetuate their species. Now that's a very bizarre strategy. Some people think it's only one species of cicada that's emerging. It's actually three species that are going to be emerging more or less simultaneously. The first one out of the box is going to be this one, Magi Cicada, which by the way means magical cicada, Septemdecim. Then we'll see the Cassinis and finally the Septendeculas. Now we can tell these cicadas apart by their size, by their coloration, but also by their songs. So let's have a listen. We'll see if we can get some of the songs working. Here's Septendecim.
That one is some kind, sometimes called the Pharaoh cicada because the song kind of goes, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, changes pitch a little bit. My favorite is actually this little rascal right here, the Cassonize. Listen to this one. And this is the rarest of the three species, the septum decula. There are also four species of 13 year cicadas, uh, Neo tradecum, tradecum, tre decassini, and tradecula. And these ones also differ in size in color pattern and in songs. The cicadas also differ in their habitat preferences, both the 17 and the 13. We usually tend to find the 17s usually in more upland situations. Uh, this, and we'll find the cassonize oftentimes in floodplains and uh, lowland areas. So they do discriminate a little bit with habitat as well. Now, how many broods are there? Well, we're making uh, uh, quite of a uh, hoopla about this particular brood 10 cicada, which is, is a very widely distributed brood. But every year in almost some part of the country, there is a brood of cicadas emerging. A brood is fundamentally a localized, geographically localized, massive emergence of cicadas that happens once every 13 or 17 years. So we have 12 broods of 17 year cicadas and three broods of 13 year cicadas for a total of 15 broods. We know in recorded history that we've already lost two broods. Brood 11, which used to occur here in Connecticut has vanished and brood 21 which used to appear down here in Florida has also vanished in recorded history. How about in our area? Well, if we first look at this map, we can see part of the reason that people are so interested about cicadas. This big brood is going to occur basically all the way from Northern Georgia and Tennessee and Carolina, all the way up the East Coast to the DC metro area and further up to all the way up to New York City. Uh, they'll also occur in Long Island and there'll be another big patch of periodical brood 10 cicadas out here in the Midwest. In our local area, we have actually five different broods of cicadas and here in Maryland and Northern Virginia, parts of West Virginia, this is where brood 10 will be most common. How did we wind up with the 15 different broods that we have today? Well, we have to travel back in time a little bit to look at some of the evolutionary history of periodical cicadas. We know that someplace about 4 million years ago, the uh, periodical cicadas evolved from their ancestors. And we don't know precisely who those ancestors were, but at this particular juncture, right about here, we had a split in the two groups. We had the decim group going this way and the Cassini and Decula group splitting here. About 2.5 million years ago, the Deculas and the Cassini clades split. And finally, during the last few hundred thousand years, about 500,000 years, we had the origin the radiation of the 15 different broods which we have today. Now, the actual genetic mechanism that allows this to happen is still completely unknown. We really don't understand the mechanism behind it, but that's what brings us to the 15 broods we have uh, here in the Eastern United States today. A few years ago, back in 2017, in my neighborhood and in some of the neighborhoods for you folks, we saw brood 10 periodical cicadas emerging off cycle. 
For cicadas that emerge off cycle, we call them stragglers, whether they emerge early or whether they emerge late. So stragglers are simply cicadas that emerge off cycle of the big synchronous brood uh, emergence of the rest of their brood mates. We believe that it's this ability of cicadas to time travel, to make these four year time jumps or sometimes one year time jump that created the 15 broods of cicadas we have today. So if you can imagine now that we have, let's say brood 14 cicadas, and they make a four year time jump, then they become brood 10. If they make a four year time jump, they become brood six. And if brood six makes uh, a four year time jump, they become brood two. A one year time jump from brood two would create brood one or brood three. And we believe that this is probably the way that we had the proliferation, the radiation of these different broods of periodical cicadas. Let's talk a little bit about synchrony, the long life cycles and prime numbers. What is that all about? Well, you know, for insects and for most other creatures on this planet, maybe accepting primates like ourselves, there has to be synchrony in the emergence of both the males and females. So basically they can find each other and hook up and fulfill that biological imperative. Now with periodical cicadas, it becomes even more important because that strange, bizarre strategy for survival, which we call predator satiation absolutely depends on those cicadas emerging synchronously in massive numbers to basically overwhelm their predators. So cicadas that might emerge a little too early or a little too late, they simply are eaten into oblivion and their silly genes are taken out of the population. So it causes a stabilizing selection for synchrony in 13 or 17 years. Why the long life cycle? Well, how could that happen? Remember, cicadas feed underground. And frankly, it's kind of cold underground. While ambient temperatures may fluctuate, the Earth temperature remains relatively cool and stable relative to the air temperature. This is the whole principle behind geothermal heating systems, right? They also feed on a nutrient poor tissue of the plant. They feed on the fluid that's carried in xylem. It's among the most nutrient poor tissues. So perhaps they're not simply receiving as much uh, high quality nutrients as other insects that feed on leaves or let's say phloem tissue or cambium tissue. In the case of periodical cicadas, size matters because in the world of insects, the bigger you are, the more eggs you can lay. And again, if you can lay more eggs, you can help to build that population strategy of having a lot of cicadas out there to basically satiate your predators. And finally, there's a hypothesis that when we have stochastic events like highly variable weather associated with the ice age, many of these cicada broods we believe differentiated during the ice age, that a longer lifespan may simply cut down the probability that you're going to emerge in a year that the, the, the winter comes and you freeze and die. So there are several different hypotheses that lead up to the long life cycles. Perhaps the most cogent and the most important reason is that by having a very long life cycle, your predators simply can't keep track of you. I'm gonna take you back now to your high school biology course or college biology course and talk about predator prey cycles. Now remember when the prey population increases, the predator population that tracks it will also increase. That will cause the prey population to collapse. Once the predators collapse, then the prey will build up again, and so followed by the predators and so on. 
Now, in the case of the periodical cicada, if this cicada emerges every year or two years, then the predators can have what we call a numerical response, the small mammals, the birds, their populations can simply build up and they can then track and diminish and eliminate that very clever survival strategy. So what did the cicada do? It greatly increased its lifetime underground. Birds, most of our birds don't live 15 years. Most of our raccoons and small mammals don't live 15 years. So they basically now have outlived the predators that could track them in time. There are, we can kind of have a proof of concept here with our friend, the dog day or annual cicada. Now you may be familiar with this particular wasp. It's a fascinating wasp. It builds a gallery in the ground. Then it will go out and it will hunt annual cicadas because annual cicadas are present every year. It can base its life cycle on the annual cicada and their populations can rise and fall as, as annual cicada populations rise and fall. So again, a different life strategy, but one that works for our friend, the cicada killer wasp. Now, let's talk a little bit about the prime number thing. I'm not gonna get into the weeds uh, tonight about uh, the relative models that have made predictions about how long life cycles should be other than to show you these two, these two graphs, which basically demonstrate if we have interacting populations of predator and prey, that prey, in this case, the cicadas, their life cycles are going to be optimized at prime numbers, things like 19, 17, 13, the predators in this interaction are going to drop out after about nine or 10 years. So uh, again, the mathematical modelers would predict exactly what we see in nature, that these long prime number years are going to be the ones selected for. The other piece of the puzzle here, gang, Imagine that we have broods of cicadas in the same area. And suppose that they emerged every two or four years. That means that every other year, every two year cycles, they would be emerging simultaneously. That would allow two and four year cicadas to interbreed, creating hybrids that might emerge in years one, two, three, or four, or five, the effect of that is then to, as Fauci would say, to flatten the curve. And because their distribution is now lower, their clever survival strategy of synchronous predator cessation has been foiled and they could be eaten into oblivion. So in areas where we do have both 13 year and 17 year cicadas, they will only emerge simultaneously once every 221 years, prime numbers. These guys are mathematical geniuses with very tiny brains. How do we know when it's time to emerge? How do they know? Well, remember they're underground and they're devoid of photo period cues, right? There's no sunlight 18 inches beneath beneath the earth. So one thing we suspect, one hypothesis has it, that in the annual cycles of our plants, and our plants are doing this right now, our trees and shrubs, remember they're feeding on plant roots underground, that there are simply fluxes in the flow of xylem. For example, in the winter time when there are no leaves on trees, there's no transpiration, there's very little xylem movement of liquid through the xylem, but when the trees produce their leaves, when transpiration is taking place and pulling that water up to the canopy of the tree to power photosynthesis, there is going to be a flux in xylem. It could be a nutrient flux, it could be a water pressure flux, it could be a flux in plant hormones, phytohormones. 
But one theory has it that the cicadas are simply underground counting the annual fluxes in the xylem tissue. Another theory might have it that they simply have some yet unknown molecular clock and they're simply ticking off those years, those 13 or 17 years with a molecular clock. We all have molecular clocks, circadian rhythms that are governed by photo period, uh, lunar cycle. So it's not beyond belief that cicadas could be doing the same thing. The big question I'm getting right now, and I've been awfully busy as uh, our graduate students and my colleague, Dr. Shrewsbury, answering lots of cicada questions, is when are they going to emerge? Well, I went out today into my garden and I put the shovel in the ground and by golly, there they were. They're getting ready. They're not quite ready to go yet, but they will be ready to go very soon. One of the first things we will begin to see under the, under the uh, drip line of plants, under the leaves or pine needles, we'll begin to see their exit holes. These are how they will escape from their subterranean crypts. In some places, there'll be little mud turrets above these holes that the cicadas build. Uh, again, the exact uh, reason of this is maybe to keep the humidity high, maybe it's for protection. And if you have stepping stones or slates out in your garden uh, and you have a big tree and some of those stepping stones are over the roots of that tree, if you pick up those stepping stones, you may begin to see the cicadas as they be, begin to build their exit galleries and they bump into that slate. And then they have to make their way to the edge of the slate to find their time in the sunshine. This is what the holes will look like when they're ready to emerge. Now, the magic number seems to be 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So when the soil temperatures reach 64 degrees Fahrenheit at the depth of eight inches, this is going to be the cue for periodical cicadas to emerge. What 64 Fahrenheit means is the world is now warm enough for the cicadas to come from the earth, to shed their skin, to climb on a tree, to harden their exoskeleton, to climb up into the canopy, to join the big boy band in the treetop, to find a mate, hook up, lay eggs, and complete their life cycle. So it's basically a cue that the world is now warm enough and thermally safe enough for them to get out of the ground and do the things they have to do. They will emerge usually at sunset, right around dusk, and they'll make a mad dash for vertical structures. So let's, let's have a look at the periodical cicada as it comes up from the earth around, oh, seven o'clock dusk on a, a nice warm May evening. They do like classical music.
the graduating class of 2021, right? Okay, Ode to Joy. We think that uh, the emergence at nightfall is a way to avoid the hungry eyes of vertebrate predators, birds and lizards and foxes and uh, other creatures that would love to make a meal of periodical cicadas. As I said before, the densities of these things can be amazing. This is one square foot. There are 30 holes. Uh, this is gonna translate into an awful lot of cicadas, uh, you know, perhaps a million or more cicadas per acre. There will be bucket loads of cicadas emerging this spring. The next uh, step in the agenda is what we call molting or ecdysis. Once it's attached itself to a tree branch or vertical structure, the cicada skin will split open along the midline. It will pump itself up, expanding itself out of the old shell. It will then hang from the shell. The wings will begin to expand. And this is basically a, a tenoral adult. This is what I believe to be one of the most beautiful stages of the periodical cicada. This whole process will take an hour or so. By dawn, their bodies will have blackened. The exoskeleton is beginning to harden and they'll be, begin their trek to up to the treetops, the canopies of the tree. Let's skip this for the sake of time. This period when their exoskeleton is soft is uh, called the tenoral period. It will last from four to six days. And this is the time that that skeleton on the outside becomes hard enough so they can walk, so they can fly, and so the females can lay their eggs in tree branches. We'll talk more about this in just a moment or two. And there are going to be a lot of cicadas. Uh, this is what a typical landscape could look like. Now, again, they're not, they're not gonna lay eggs in the, your herbaceous perennials. This is simply a place underneath a large tree where they've all moved up from the nighttime, shed their skins, and they're getting ready to fly up into the treetops. The adults are going to live, any individual will live anywhere from probably two to four weeks. And while they're in the treetops, they will feed. They have a sucking mouth part. Here you can see a little bit of the liquid excrement from a periodical cicada as it feeds on a leaf. Um, if you're standing under a tree, perhaps with lots of cicadas, like the old Credence Clearwater Revival song, it may actually rain on a sunny day as uh, a little bit of uh, cicada honeydew, shall we say, rains down on you. It'll be a mad dash, as I said, up into the treetops once their uh, exoskeleton has hardened enough for them to walk, feed, find their mates, and fly. Let's talk a little bit now about cicada songs before we move forward. Basically, the cicada songs are distinct to the different species. Remember that there are three different species emerging simultaneously this year. And for those cicadas to collect in the right place at the right time, they have to have unique songs. Now, cicadas make sound with an organ on the sides of their abdomen called the timbal organ. Let's see how it works. And by the way, no, no cicadas were harmed in the making of this webinar tonight. Um, the timbal organ is like a membrane. It has muscles attached to it. The cicada can vibrate that timbal organ by contracting those muscles. The abdomen of the male cicada, and it's only the males that chorus, is hollow. And this creates a reverberation chamber that amplifies the sound that the cicada makes. And the sound can be 
rather loud. It can be anywhere from 80 to perhaps 100 decibels in a cicada chorus. That's the sound of a lawnmower or perhaps a jet airplane flying overhead. One of the questions I'm always asked is, are there blue-eyed cicadas? And sure, there's variation in eye color. Most of their eyes will be brilliant red, but we will see oranges, whites, and in some cases, we will see blue-eyed cicadas as well. Is it one in a million? I don't think so. I tend to see variation in eye color every year. I've never been at a brood, and I've been at at least a dozen of these where I have not seen a, an off-color white or in this case, a very lovely uh, blue eye. So let's talk about the calling behavior now. That call you heard before is what we call the alarm call or the squawk call. And again, it's gonna sound a bit like this. That's what the cicada uses when a bug geek like myself picks it up or perhaps a bird or a lizard attacks. The calling song is the one they use to assemble everybody in the same place. And the courtship song is what happens when the male and the female cicada get eyeball to eyeball. What he's going to do is use his very best performance to try to convince that special someone that she should be the mother of his nymphs. So once they're eyeball to eyeball, he'll go into his courtship song and uh, try to win his mate. So let's listen to the courtship song of the Septendecim. Okay, hey, if he's got a good performance, she's gonna signal that uh, you're really cool by flicking her wings, make a little flicking sound like this. And the deal then is sealed. He's gonna mate with her and uh, she will become impregnated and eventually the mother of his nymphs. Um, Females also can hear, as can male cicadas, they have an eardrum cordotonal like organ, which we call a tympana. Uh, the females are good flyers and will fly to these choruses. As I said, they will signify acceptance with their wing flicks. And, you know, this is a pretty romantic moment for cicadas. I think the male's a little camera shy, you know, bug geeks with cameras. It's pretty easy to tell the males from the females. The males will have kind of a rounded abdomen. The females will have a pointy abdomen. And this appendage you see right here is houses the ovipositor, which she'll use to insert her eggs into the plant. Now, she'll test various twigs. They'll usually prefer uh, twigs that are about three to 11 millimeters in width. She will then use her ovipositor to slice the bark of the tree, and then she will inject eggs into these slits. Let's have a look. Here you can see her abdomen pulsing as she pushes eggs down the ovipositor into the, we call these egg nests that she's created in the bark of the tree. Each egg nest can contain anywhere from 20 to 30 eggs and she will lay somewhere between 400 and 600 eggs total. 
the eggs are going to mature in the tree branches in maybe six to 10 weeks. And then once they hatch, they're going to drop 80 feet to the ground, bounce twice. They're going to burrow in, find roots of trees, and resume a life underground for another 17 years or 13 years, feeding on the xylem tissue uh, beneath the earth. So that's the uh, almost the final act here in the life cycle. Now, when will we see cicadas emerge this year in Maryland? Well, last year in 2020, using data collected by the Cicada Safari app, which I'll talk about, this is a citizen science project that we're using to harvest vast amounts of data. What I learned from uh, last year's uh, stragglers that emerged in places like uh, the DC and Maryland area, Northern Virginia, and in Ohio and Kentucky, the very first cicada out of the ground right here at day 110, April 19th, emerged just outside of Towson, Maryland. But this is very much an outlier, as you can see from this graph. The bulk of cicadas, in other words, half of the cicadas enclosed in this box, emerged the last two weeks of May with the median emergence occurring, I think, on day 148, which puts it about something like May 28th. They continued on until uh, June 14th, day 165 or something like that. But again, we think the big tsunami during the Cicada Palooza is going to happen right around those last two weeks of May. That's when the big boy band is gonna kick it off in the treetops. And uh, those teenagers that have been underground for 17 years live in a COVID-like existence, they're gonna get up out of the ground and go have a big party. So that's what I think we're gonna see cicadas this year. Mid-May to early June. Let's come back now for a minute to the strategies for survival business. As I said before, our dog day, our non-periodical cicadas rely on crypsis, disruptive coloration, rapid evasive flight. The periodical cicadas, nah, not so much. Predator satiation, they're kind of slow flyers, where if these guys are the F-14s of the insect world, these guys are the Hindenburgs. They're gonna kind of bumble around. They're gonna bump into you. It's not gonna hurt much unless you're on your motorcycle going fast without a helmet. Yeah, then they could sting you a little bit, I guess. But for the most of us, hey, they're just gonna land on us. And they're not gonna, people say, oh, they're, they're coming after. They're not coming after you. They're just not very clever flyers and they're trying to get up to the big chorus, the party in the treetop and you're in the way and they're gonna bump into you. So don't worry about that. They're not gonna bite or sting. You're gonna be okay. They've been described historically as poor defenseless species. Uh, Kasson wrote, they've, he's never seen animals more entirely stupid than the 17 year locust. They make the, no effort to escape, but allow themselves to be captured with perfect permissiveness, passiveness. And as you can see, here's a predatory stink bug. It's got its beak in an animal that's gotta be 10 times more massive. How it pulls that off, I don't know. But these poor cicadas are going to be uh, eaten by many, many different things. Uh, I've been studying some of the relationships and asked the question, are they really, really defenseless? And I studied this back in 2004, again in 2013 and 2017, and this is what I've learned, that for the most part, yeah, they're not so good at getting away, 60% uh, of them could not escape a simulated attack. In some cases, they will fly or drop off the plant. And what I learned is that's temperature dependent. So at very cold temperatures, they drop from the plant, but at very warm temperatures, 33 Fahrenheit, that's up into close to the 90s, they're gonna fly. So when it's cool down in the 40s, they just drop from the plant. When it's hot, they're gonna fly. That's what they do. Okay, now, this hard knock life includes attack by a whole variety of vertebrate predators, things like birds, for example.
that perilous time when they're molting, shedding their skin, they're going to be under attack from a wide variety of invertebrate predators. Here are carpenter ants devouring a cicada as it attempts to molt. But perhaps the most fascinating natural enemy of the periodical cicada is a fungal disease called Massospora cicadini. Now, this one is quite bizarre. Massospora has been laying in wait for 17 years as a spore on the surface of the ground from which cicadas will emerge. As the nymphs emerge, they will pick up those spores. The spores will then germinate, penetrate the skin of the cicada. They'll multiply inside the cicada and they will turn its abdomen into a fungus garden. Now, as cicadas move about the environment, Somehow or another, they will be able to survive with a dysfunctional abdomen. In some cases, the abdomen will fall off very late in the infection. But while they are still alive, the male cicada, even though his genitalia are now non-functional, will attempt to mate with the female cicada and he will transmit the fungal spores to her, infecting her, and now Massospora becomes an STD in the cicada population and is spread from males to females. Now, the most bizarre part of this story, remember how I told you that the female cicada would signify her acceptance by flicking her, making a little clicking noise with her wings? Massospora fungus makes the male cicada, he, it basically feminizes the male cicada. So the male cicada will click its wings, thereby attracting other males to mate with him, infecting those males, which then continue to spread the massospora through the cicada population. How bizarre is that? Massospora takes over mind control of the male cicada and turns it into a little bit of a zombie. That's kind of crazy. Everything on the planet's gonna wanna love to eat a cicada, small mammals, uh, turtles, uh, various other reptiles. Uh, they're gonna show up on pizza. Um, a, lot of, a lot of different creatures will be eating cicadas, including me. Now, their final act of contrition is to return nutrients to the ecosystem. So as they die, their little bodies are gonna rain down on the ground. They're going to decompose and they're going to return nutrients to the very plants that spawn them. They're going to feed a number of invertebrates on the soil surface, things like tiny ants, which will help to recycle. And those holes they made in the earth are going to remain there, not just for one season, but for several years, perhaps, adding water infiltration to a depth of maybe a foot or, or 18 inches into the ground. So allowing water to percolate down into the ground and help sustain those trees from which they were spawned. Cicada killer wasps. Well, you know, they will take a cicada, I think if they find it, but basically they are specialists on the dog day cicada. So their, their generations really don't overlap very much. Uh, I'm, there have been records of these guys coming after or taking a periodical cicada, but these guys really are specialists on our dog day cicadas. All right, let's talk a little bit about the downside here, cicada damage. Remember, those eggs are gonna be laid in tree branches. In some cases, when there are a lot of egg nests in there, those branches are going to wither, they're going to snap, in some cases fall off trees. It's gonna be called flagging. Some people will say, I've read uh, in uh, the popular um, press that cicadas are natural pruners of trees. And as if this is some kind of thing the tree, really, tree would really like. I don't think that any tree really likes this. So they are going to create a bit of damage on those trees. Now, what we know from the scientific literature 
is that mature, well-established trees will show no mortality and they will show no reduction, long-term reduction in radial growth. So for mature, well-established trees, we're not going to worry about that damage. We might want to come out and prune it off or something like that if we felt we had to do something, but your mature established trees are going to be just fine, thank you. The ones we're really worried about are ones just like this. This tree was transplanted uh, along Route 29 here in Columbia the year before the periodical cicada, and this is what the damage looked like. Now, Cicadas like trees with open branching habits, with very elongated branches, with lots of tender branches, and that exactly describes a young sapling that's been recently transplanted. So these are the ones, in my opinion, as you can see, they've got a big host range. They will lay on many, many different kinds of woody trees and, and some shrubs as well. They're not gonna like uh, conifers in particular, trees with very dense uh, needles and things like this. So this is the one we're really concerned about. So mature trees like this, the established trees, they're gonna be okay. Trees like this, um, maybe not so much. I've talked to nursery growers that have planted fields of, uh, of ornamental trees the year before the cicada, had heavy cicada damage and their trees were killed. This is what the damage is going to look like. This causes the flagging. Now, what can you do? Well, I heard I could wrap the tree in cheesecloth or mosquito netting. Well, maybe. I could wrap bands of sticky stuff on it. And as the cicada nymphs came up, they get stuck in the sticky stuff. Well, that could happen too. But remember, the cicadas are going to go over here to a treetop. They're going to chorus. They're going to have a, a big party. And then the females are going to fly away to other trees to lay their eggs. So that's not going to stop them from getting into the canopy of your tree. So I don't think that's so hot. Oh, you can spray them with pesticides. Look at this one. Hey, it has cicadas right on the level, on the label, right? By Fenthrin. That's one of the sledgehammers in our industry, synthetic pyrethroid. Don't do that. Don't do that. And here's why I say don't do that. There have been several scientific studies, including uh, one of my own, which have demonstrated that you can treat trees with things like organophosphate, synthetic pyrethroids, and still not eliminate the damage that cicadas cause. However, if you wrap your trees in netting with a mesh size of one centimeter or three eighths of an inch, it will almost completely protect those trees. In this particular study done by an orchardist at a fruit research station in West Virginia, he repeatedly treated those trees. So every three days he would be applying pesticides and it still didn't work, why? Because you might apply a pesticide one day, kill 20 cicadas, then three days later, there are 50 more. You spray them. The day, three days later, there are 50 more. It's not going to work. We did the same thing with a neonicotinoid insecticide imidacloprid. We found that it gave us some protection, but not nearly as good a protection as simply netting that tree. So what we're recommending is if you're concerned about cicadas, that Netting is the way to go. The way to go is not to spray these things with insecticides. The insecticides, again, are gonna to be toxic to the non-target animals, your beneficial insects, your pollinators, birds that might alight in those trees. You don't wanna do that. Now, there has been concern about creatures being caught in the cicada netting. Uh, make sure there are no nesting birds before you put your netting on. Be sure to tie it at the bottom so birds can't get up inside or snakes don't try to climb the tree. And if you just don't think you want to do it, that's your personal call. That's your choice. If you don't want to net your trees, don't net your trees. I'm not saying you have to do this. It's a country of choice, but I think this is the way we can really help to protect our trees 
Uh, this is our field plot. We had dozens of trees out here in this field for this experiment. Not one of those trees in a net had a bird or a reptile or any other kind of creature get stuck in that netting. So I think if you do it right, you're gonna be okay. You'll be able to buy this online, uh, cicada netting. I can't give you a website right now. I just haven't looked myself. Or if you're concerned, you can simply prune out some of the damage. Other things that are gonna be fun to do with cicadas. Well, your pets are gonna to wanna to eat them. That golden is gonna to wanna to go out there every day and just gorge on cicadas. Uh, don't let them do that. You know, everything in moderation, a few, okay, no problem. We have had reports of people that have allowed their dog in particular to eat as many cicadas as they want. It wasn't a good idea. They got a little bit impacted. So uh, everything in moderation. If they're in your swimming pool, go ahead and skim them out, no problem. You can cover your garden ponds with netting if you don't want them to get in. Eat some if you like. Uh, I know for many, they're gonna be a gourmet treat. Um, a few years ago, back in 2004, we have a group of graduate students we're working with right now. They call themselves the Cicada Crew. I'll talk more about them in a few minutes, but in 04, we had a group of grad students, they called themselves the Cicada Maniacs. And one of the maniacs wrote the Cicadalicious Cookbook, which became a bestseller. It's chock-a-block full of cicada recipes. Uh, I often will be asked to eat cicadas. Everybody likes to see a bug geek eat a cicada. And it turns out that back in, uh, I think it was 2013, uh, somehow one of Jay Leno's producers saw me clowning around with a Today Show crew. And she said, well, how would you like to come to California and see if Jay Leno will eat cicadas? And I said, well, how could I pass that chance up? So I smuggled a couple dozen out in my carry-on bag. We had them prepared very nicely. They were on a little skewer. We had about six cicadas lined up on a skewer. They'd been nicely prepared, roasted with some nice seasoning. And uh, the producers told me, she said, well, you can eat one yourself, offer one to Jay, and then offer another one to the other guests on the show. Well, it turned out that night, the other guest was Russell Crowe, who had just come off the Superman movie where he plays Jarrell, Superman's father. So after I got done with my shtick, playing the scientist and describing cicadas, uh, Jay asked me, he said, well, well, Professor Rauch, does uh, anything eat cicadas? And I said, sure, Jay. I said, everything wants to eat a cicada. He said, well, do humans eat cicadas? I said, yeah, look at this. And I held up the skewer and said, you know, here they are. They've been prepared. And I popped one in my mouth and I said, oh, that's got a buttery texture. It's got a, a nutty flavor. And as I turned to Jay to offer one, Russell Crowe is now sitting behind me and he whispers to me and he says, I'm not going to eat it, mate. So with this, I held out the skewer. I said, Jay, if you eat a cicada, I'll give you a dollar. And he took one and he popped it in his mouth and he said, mm, they're better than Cheetos. And then he took the cicadas and he pointed them at Russell Crowe and he said, Superman's father. He was kind of putting a little beat down on Russell. And to this, Russell Crowe replied, no thanks, mate. There are no cicadas on Krypton. He's probably right. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a spectacular learning experience. We hope that a lot of people will get out and just enjoy this. This doesn't happen anywhere else in the planet. So uh, it only happens in a few times in a lifetime. And this year, we are going to have literally billions, if not trillions of cicadas interacting with tens of millions of human beings in the major megalopolis here on the East Coast, also in the Midwest, people are gonna have cicadas. It's gonna be like having a National Geographic special right in your own backyard or a BBC special. And you can be David Attenborough if you want for a couple days. There are some people that will be concerned about this. I take that very seriously. I think the important thing to do right now is to learn as much as you can about cicadas, learn that they're not gonna bite or sting, they're not gonna fly away with dogs and small children like the monkeys in the Wizard of Oz, they're harmless. 
If you're holding one, if it's thirsty, it might give you a little peck with its beak. It's not going to break the skin. You'll be okay. If you still are very concerned, I would suggest that you talk to a counselor, seek some counseling, try to help understand this. And finally, if you just can't take it, I get that too. Hey, go over to Ocean City, go over to Bethany. They're not going to have cicadas. Go to Florida. They're not going to have cicadas. Go to St. Mary's County. No cicadas. West in the Mississippi. Go to California. Get your shots so you can travel. You can get out of town and get away from the cicadas. But don't do that. It's going to be way too much fun. Now, if you want to help the scientists, you can get this free app. It's a free download for iPhones or Android, so called Cicada Safari. What you will do is download it. You're going to snap a picture of what you think is a cicada. It's going to kick back to us. We're going to identify it, vet it. And this is going to give us the information about where cicadas are. We still don't know exactly where cicadas are. And it will also help us learn when cicadas are going to appear. That data I showed you a little bit earlier came from Cicada Safari. So this is a really good, fun project. The other things I would recommend, resources, you can go to our website, the Cicada Crew UMD. So if you type into a browser this link or Cicada Crew UMD, it will take you to our website. At the website, we have a gallery. We've got frequently asked questions. We've got resources, links to other websites, including Home and Gardens, really good um, cicada uh, information page, their websites, and several other websites you can find there. And if you want to buy a cicada t-shirt, that's great. The money goes to our graduate students. So if you want to help out uh, the, the flagship, uh, go buy a t-shirt. We've got onesies. We've got masks with cicadas on. It's pretty cool. Cicada Mania is the uh, resource for all things cicadas. When I want a cicada answer, I go to Cicada Mania. The University of Connecticut has a wonderful website. And the Audubon Naturalist Society, in collaboration with George Washington University, has a wonderful website with lots of activities for school children. It's called Friend to Cicadas. So these are good resources. So with that, I want to thank you for inviting me into your homes this evening. Uh, me and the cicada, we're going to be waving at you in just a few short weeks. Um, I'll be uh, writing episodes on Bug of the Week very shortly. So you, if you're a aficionado at Bug of the Week, stop in for visits. I'll be catching you up. And go to the Cicada Crew. We'll be, we have an Instagram and Facebook account. You can have your questions answered there, I think. So with that, thank you very much. And Steph, if we've got time for questions, I'd be glad to take a shot at those as well. Thank you so much. And Excellent. enjoy those cicadas. It's going to be great, gang. <laughs> Thanks so much. And we do, in fact, have quite a few questions that okay, have been coming go. in. Um, I'll try to ask them in a way that makes sense. So I think a lot of folks um, have questions about their trees and how to um, protect their trees. Um, so some folks, one of the questions is a clarification of what is recently transplanted in order um, to protect those recently transplanted trees. That's a recently transplanted tree. OK. <laughs> Um, how about very uh, small trees or seedlings that are only a year old? You know, that's a good question, uh, Stephanie, and that one's come up a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, again, this is not, you know, this uh, Acer palmatum is not recently transplanted, but due to its small size and its vulnerability, the, uh, this particular homeowner said, yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. So again, uh, you know, I think uh, if you have highly valuable trees that you can net. The other piece of the puzzle though, gang, first question, did you have cicadas in 2004? If you didn't have cicadas in 2004, you're unlikely to have them now. If you moved in in 2010, ask your neighbor. So if there were no cicadas in 04, unlikely you're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, Steph, a little tiny sapling, a little whip. That's going to be really easy to net. And by the way, gang, this netting is not expensive. We paid about 
three dollars for material and we can net a tree in about 20 minutes that's less than it's going to cost you to buy pesticide and squirt it on their gang so this is going to be very cost effective now a little whip um i'd be more worried about deer or a rabbit mm -hmm. than a cicada but you know what the heck it certainly couldn't hurt to put a little call make just make a little cylinder drop it over there uh, close it up. But uh, I think they're going to tend to go to bigger trees. Again, they really like to lay those eggs in lateral branches that are somewhere between, you know, three and 11 millimeters in width. So a little tiny whip that's going in, maybe not so much to worry about, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to take you 30 seconds to put a net around that thing. Sure. And so related folks are asking about if newly planted shrubs um, like Father Gillar, rhododendron, if they also need protection and yeah, if new I've perennials seen, need protection. Great too. question. I have seen eggs being laid in woody shrubs as well. Wygelias, um, the ones you mentioned as well. So yes, I think that to be prudent, uh, if you want to protect those, that's a good idea as well. Okay. Um, and can folks use tool to protect their trees? Use what? Tool. What's that? Um, I'm trying to think how to best explain it. Like a wedding dress, sometimes the poofy ones, they have that tool. Oh, yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, sure, sure, why not? I guess <laughs> after the after the bride, and, and I have been getting a lot of calls from the mothers of the bride trying to find out <laughs> when they should plan that outdoor wedding. And I'm saying <laughs> definitely plan it for Memorial Day weekend because a thousand surprise visitors are just going to make that wedding so much more memorable you know so or you could do it uh before may one would be great and i think if you hold off to about the third week in june uh, but if you have that april wedding and you you're trying to figure out something to do with the veil sure you can wrap a little tree in it i think um that'll work as well but I think they, I actually think the cicada netting you buy online is going to be less expensive maybe than the tool. Yeah, that's what someone said in the chat too. Okay. Um, and you kind of touched on one of the other questions that is in the chat box a lot. Um, when are they kind of finished? Like when do we expect them to be out of the area and related when would it be safe to start pruning the damaged parts of your trees and shrubs out? You can you can do that right away. As soon as you see flagging, uh, go ahead and prune it out. Yeah, no problem with that. Um, they will be done almost assuredly by certainly by the third week of June. All that business is going to be over. I'm guessing maybe as early as the second week of June, but I would think by the third week in June, the egg laying will be finished. Okay. Um, let's see, how far down do they burrow? Good question. Uh, I've heard reports uh, right now they're about eight inches below the surface of the ground, but I think I've heard as, as far maybe as 18 or two feet, they can be down underground uh, feeding on roots. Sometimes they're very close to the surface. I'm sure some of you had the experience of planting a tree or turning over your flower beds and seeing a periodical cicada. So I've seen them as high in a soil profile as maybe five or six inches feeding underground. Okay. And are there any kind of local areas like maybe a new neighborhood or a new park that just won't have cicadas? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. That's a great, that's a great question. Understand, please, gang, that, you know, a lot of people think that 400 years ago, we had these wonderful virgin forests here in North America. Wrong. When the colonists got here, the first thing they did was chop down all the trees to basically build their homes, make their fires and build ships. So that was the huge impact. I think the huge negative impact on cicadas was during our colonial time when we cleared our forest. Now, in some cases, I think the situation for cicadas has actually gotten better. So if we have uh, basically forest preserves and what was once a tobacco field has now been allowed to go through ecological succession. So there are young trees, or if it's been turned into forest preservation or a park, or if in the intervening years, there's been a development where people have planted trees and parks have been built, things are getting better for cicadas. But for circumstances where somebody had a forest and the developer came in and cut down the trees 
The next thing that happens is they take away two feet of topsoil. Those cicadas are gone. And once it's put under impervious surface in places like Maple Lawn or Reston, once it's paved over, cicadas are gone forever. And I think that's part of the reason we've seen at least two broods go extinct. And in several places in the Northeast where there were once cicadas, there are no longer cicadas. So certainly habitat destruction has reduced the places where cicadas are. The other piece of the puzzle, Stephanie, is cicadas are going to be very patchy in distribution. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some neighborhoods like mine that are just rocking out. University Park, rocking out. Um, Cockeysville, rocking out. So uh, there'll be, <laughs> be lots of places where there are lots of cicadas. In the area around Frederick last time, there weren't many cicadas, but a few miles away in Laytonsville, there were lots of cicadas. So mm -hmm. it'll be patchy. Got it. And then there's a lot of questions related um, to their distribution as well. So some kind of some folks are wondering, like, why doesn't Ocean City get them? And I think someone was asking um, if they don't have them in St. Mary's County, do they have them in Charles County? Yeah, you know, I'm going to try to get back to that map. That's a nice John Zyla map, who's our local cicada genius here in Maryland. I'm just going to get back to that map and we'll talk about it for a minute. You know, I've had a lot of questions about that. Is it something to do with uh, the sandy soil? Remember that these guys basically radiated. In other words, we got those 15 broods in the last couple hundred thousand years. And remember, during the last couple hundred thousand years, even tens of thousands of years, that sea levels have risen and fallen several times during periods of glaciation and periods when the earth has been warmer. And our eastern shore and our coastal plain at certain periods of time was simply underwater. Now, cicadas can hold their breath, I know, for a little while, but they can't hold their breath for decades or 100 years. So I'm guessing the reason that we don't have cicadas over here on the eastern shore is simply at some point in time, that part of uh, Maryland was probably underwater when cicadas were moving up and down the Appalachians in relation to glacial advances and retreats. Same thing for St. Mary's, I think, uh, down at the tip here, no brood tens, although there's a brood two, and there's a really cool brood called brood 19 down here. That's a 13-year cicada, which is way cool. So I think that's probably the reason. Uh, that's, that's my best guess on it. Yeah, and related some, actually a lot of people had the same question about why this happens um, here in the US and especially towards the East and why doesn't it happen anywhere else on the planet? Lucky us, what else can I tell you? <laughs> you know, uh, mother nature's plan. I, I mean, we all have distributions, you know, there are, there are only pandas in, in parts of Asia. There are only, um, you know, penguins in Australia and uh, at the South Pole. So, hey, you know, uh, it's just how it's just how life is distributed on our planet. It's patchy. And these guys, again, some several million years ago, they broke away from the other cicadas. And by the way, there are more than 3000 species of cicadas found on every continent on Earth except Antarctica. But we're the lucky ones because we're the only ones that have these uh, strange 13 and 17 year periodical cicadas. It's just what mother nature's grand plan is. Excellent. <laughs> um, so very uh, important question from a lot of folks. Will this affect their fruit and veggie plants? Um, and specifically, we had a question about pawpaw trees. Well, sure. Pawpaws are woody plants. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if uh, they lay eggs in a pawpaw. Uh, yeah, that's that's likely, I think. But your your herbaceous plants, not so much. I, I don't think I've ever had a record uh, or or seen anything about them laying eggs into vegetable plants. Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna just plead ignorance here. I just have not heard that. I'm not saying it can't be so, but since I have not heard this, I don't believe that happens. I think it's got to be pretty much woody tissue, not sure. not your not your tomatoes or beans or um, uh, spinach or broccoli. I don't think that's gonna happen. You may see them on there, you know, as they emerge from the ground, I guess, 
they might go over there and, and take a sip of uh, xylem fluid because those plants will have xylem. But mm -hmm. in terms of laying eggs, I don't think so. Um, we had a couple other specific species questions like um, the Japanese maple, crepe myrtle, magnolias. I think generally, are you looking more for like the size of the tree and whether or not it's new and you should just protect anything that is new or recently transplanted or small? Yeah, I think, you're, again, your mature established trees, you know, if, you, if you've got solangianas or, you know, uh, southern magnolias or, you know, uh, they're well-established magnolia trees, they will lay eggs. I have seen that in magnolias, but as long as they're large and well-established, they should be fine. Same thing with crepe myrtles. Um, you know, again, it's you have to be practical here as well. I don't want people climbing up 50 foot ladders to try to put netting around those trees. Uh, you know, that just doesn't make sense and it's risky. So if the trees are small, and again, you know, I'm gonna take you back here to the ones that, the ones that are at the greatest risk. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of not making this stuff up, gang. Um, <laughs> this is, you know, a tree like that, that tree is probably, you know, that's three feet, six feet, that might be a nine or 10 foot tree. That's what it could look like, okay? This tree, you know, these other trees I showed you, that tree, it's gonna be fine. That little tree where every branch is exactly the right size and the cicadas love to lay their eggs in those rapidly growing tender green branches. You know, that one's the one that's, that's gonna have the problem. Beyond that, I really can't tell you. Um, Mm -hmm. I really can't tell you. It's gotcha. going to be your call. And then um, how long should folks be leaving the nets on to protect? Yeah, I think to be safe, as I said, uh, in, as I showed you that other graph, certainly the tsunami hits uh, around this second, uh, third and fourth week of May to early June. So I think if your netting is up, let's say by mm, the end of April, first of May, you're going to be okay. They're not going to be that many out. And I think it can come off. You'll know when the cicadas are tailing off. You're going to see them dying on the ground and under the trees. And when that happens, just take it off. And uh, that'll be um, the end of the story. OK. Um, another question that a couple of people had, which I've never heard of this one before, but does it attract copperheads like the snakes? Does it attract copperheads? Does the, like, does the emergence is it someone asking, is it true that they attract copperhead snakes to I, residential I, areas where all the bugs are? I have never heard that before. Okay, yeah, two different folks asked about it, which is- very Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> uh, well, if it does, I'd sure like to know because I, I, I remember when I was a Boy Scout, we used to get lots of points if we could catch a copperhead. And I know we've got a lot over in P Prince George's County uh, I've not heard that, and I really couldn't understand why. You may see a copperhead eating cicadas, uh, but I think if you put, you know, uh, a thousand little mice, dead mice under a tree, you'd see copperheads eating those things too. So um, would, do they differentially attract copperheads? Boy, I sure have never heard that. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful notion. And if it happens, I'd sure love to know. And I'll write about that. And I just think it it's it's a fascinating possibility, but I there's no basis in science that I'm aware okay. of that, that that takes place. There is a comment from one of the folks who asked and they live in Calvert County and they said that there's a lot of copperheads there and that they like to eat the cicadas there. Well, you know, I bet they do. I think, like I said, everything on the planet is going to love to eat a cicada. Uh, turtles, fish, all the birds. The birds are going to lay more eggs in some species. Some may double clutch. They're going to have all kinds of food for their young. So all those guys higher up in the food web, this is going to be a big bounty for them. So this is, uh, cicadas are masters of transferring energy and materials up and down food webs. Mm -hmm. So that's one of their real benefits is so many things are going to benefit from these cicadas coming out this year. Yeah, absolutely. Related folks had asked about owls, if they will get a boost from having these as a food source and same with the bats, if they'll be able to eat them. Well, you know, your raptors, <laughs> uh, your raptors are going to take advantage of all the extra little birdies that are flying around, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the owls are going to go after these too much. They might. 
Uh, the other one, bats, um, you know, the bats are going to be, of course, you know, they're nocturnal. Cicadas are mostly mm -hmm. diurnal. The big boy bend is going to crank the loudest uh, in the middle of the day when the temperature is 90. At mm -hmm. night, they're generally going to calm down. Um, if a bat found one, yeah, why not? Uh, if an owl found one, yeah, I guess it could happen, but they're not going to be the primaries in this, I don't think. Great, great question, though. Great question. Yeah, there, there's so many great questions. Um, the next one's also kind of related to the food web, but will the spotted lanternfly be a cicada predator? I wish. I, uh, <laughs> or would vice versa. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't we love it if the cicadas could suck on another sucking insect, but mm -hmm. that's not going to happen, <laughs> unfortunately. But hey, the good news with the spotted lanternfly is many of our indigenous natural enemies are now jumping on that thing. We have lots of reports praying mantises are eating them, yeah, uh, assassin bugs, and there are two species of naturally occurring fungi that are important in collapsing populations. So we're getting some good news on we call it uh, biotic resistance. There's a little bit of pushback from our indigenous natural enemies on spotted lanternfly as well. So that's some good news. Great. Um, I thought this question was really fun. Can you use the cicadas for fishing? Oh yeah, the fish are gonna love them. Awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> Very cool. Um, a couple of folks had the same question about will herbicides or fertilizers, fertilizers affect the cicadas underground? It's a good question. You know, I had this question before, you know, I don't really, I don't really see uh, your herbicides, the ones that you're putting on for your, your, you know, your broadleaf weeds in your lawn or something like that having an impact. These guys have the ability to switch. Uh, I don't know of any study that's directly examined the effect of an herbicide on a cicada. I'm kind of guessing the mode of action, you know, the way it, it kills a weed, it would be very different than uh, cicada metabolism. So I wouldn't be worried about that in particular. And these guys have the ability to switch from tree roots to shrub roots to grass roots. So, um, okay. you know, I'm, I'm kind of the wrong guy to ask about herbicides because I just don't use them. So. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I don't know the answer, but I doubt that that's important. Fertilizers, yeah, I think uh, the more fertilizer you put on, the healthier your tree is going to be, or the faster it's going to be moving, not necessarily healthier, but the faster it's going to be moving nutrients uh, up to the canopy and anything I would think that might increase uh, nitrogen content in xylem tissue could benefit a cicada, maybe make a much bigger cicada, I don't know. I, I don't think there have been, there are no studies. Is there a study? I think there actually was one study where they fertilized trees and the cicadas emerged early. I'd have okay. to double check the literature, the primary for that, but that's kind of ringing a bell. So yeah, maybe gotcha. that's good for cicadas unless it makes them emerge a year too early, then that's not good. Got it. Um, okay, so we just, we have a lot of questions left, but I'll just get to a few more because we don't have much time left. Um, over time, can an area that was not popular with cicadas before become an area that has lots of them? It could. It depends, again, if there's a forest remnant uh, that still has a, an existing population, and they can fly relatively long distances, certainly hundreds of yards. And uh, yeah, if people have planted young trees in a place where there, were, or there are cicadas nearby, sure, they can be colonized, yeah. Uh, in a famous experiment, one of the early cicada scientists tried to create a population of cicadas on the National Mall. He brought thousands of eggs there, egg branches. The cicadas hatched, they colonized the trees, they emerged right on time 17 years later, and a flock of birds came and ate them into oblivion, basically proving the concept that you have to have massive numbers emerging to create a brood of cicadas. Got it. And um, that was a kind of a related question is once they do emerge, how far do they travel from the site where they emerge? Right. They, I've seen them fly uh, certainly 
hundreds of meters probably is a reasonable because they will all collect. So ones that are emerging from a tree, let's say a football field away, if that big chorus is the, if the party's up in a, in a big oak tree or a maple tree and it's a hundred yards away, they are going to fly over there to find their mates and then they will disperse again to other trees to lay their eggs. So yeah, they're gonna move around. Okay, great. So we've still got a lot more questions, but I know we won't be able to get to them all. So Mike, can we just direct them to a place where they can uh, get their questions answered if they weren't able to tonight? I did put the link to the Cicada Crew website in the chat. So if you guys want to make sure to click on that and grab that link uh, before you leave the presentation tonight, you can get a lot of information from their site and also connect with them on all of their social sites are listed on that website too. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. That's great. And yeah, the, I'm sure the Cicada Crew will... Uh, try to wade through them. We'll, we'll help uh, the crew uh, if they get stuck on questions. But these guys are very clever and they're doing great work. So uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to have a look at some of the questions that might remain. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, that sounds good. Um, we are at the end of our time limit for this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.